First Baptist Marktree, where we reach the lost, equip the saints, raise babies, teach them the law of God, all for His glory. Romans 11:36. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. If you have your Bibles today, turn to the book of Matthew. And we're going to finish Matthew chapter 2 today. There were three preachers who were eating lunch, and it was the summer, and they all determined that they had mice problems in their church. And uh, the first preacher said, well, you know, we've, we've beat on things. We made a bunch of noise. We're trying to get them out of there. Um, you know, we set the traps out. We, um, you know, we'd, we used the spray. We did all kind of stuff. We still got mice problems. The second preacher said, well, we called in the experts. And the experts came in, and they did what they do, and we paid them $4,000, and we've still got mice running around everywhere. And the third preacher, he had it figured out. He said, uh, boys, I got rid of the mice problem at my church. You know what I did? He said, I baptized every one of them mice, and I put them on the church roll. And I hadn't seen any of them back in that church since. <laughs> we are glad that you are here today. So good to see you. We are going to give you the book. Today, we're going to finish Matthew chapter 2. And Matthew is really laying the scene for what I call the second exodus. The second exodus meaning that the New Testament from the time of Christ, when he inaugurates the new covenant in his blood, which he says at the Last Supper, we have a period of time from 30 to 80, 70, but we have the picture of the second exodus. And if you're not familiar with the first exodus, then understanding the second exodus is going to be difficult. There is a book, the second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, that deals with the period of 40 years where God called his people Israel. He called his people Israel, and for 40 years they endured testing as he established their covenant uh, with them. Now, Jesus is pictured as the new Israel. God will establish a new covenant with Jesus Christ, and his followers will endure a similar 40-year period. And today we're going to look at some of the similarities in the life of Jesus and Israel and some of the life of Jesus as the new Moses. Jesus will be pictured as a new leader who will lead his people out. If you would, stand with me one more time as we read Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. And we'll read from verse 13 all the way down through uh, the end of the chapter. Hear now the word of the only living and the only true God. And if you can see that on the screen, you have got really good eyes, let me tell you. Now when they had departed... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose and took the child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Let's pray. Lord, be with us today as we study your word. Lord, may it be a blessing to those who hear it. Lord, there are many people in the room today, many who are going through different things. Lord, I believe with all my heart that 30 to 35 minutes learning about the king of the world might just allow us to rest easy for a while. Lord, we love you. Help us to learn. In your name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. All right, Jesus fulfilled in his first coming over 300 prophecies, as some scholars uh, believe, three of which are mentioned in this passage today. The first one that's mentioned is, Out of Egypt I called my son. 
Uh, we're going to read a lot of scriptures today, and you're going to have to turn to two different passages with me. But I really want you to lock in and understand this. And the more that we understand what Matthew is trying to accomplish and teach us about Jesus, then the better we'll be able to understand the New Testament. Now, I mean this in the nicest way, but sometimes I read the Bible and I'm like, what in the world is this talking about? Y'all ever, y'all ever do that? Don't be looking at me all holy. I know some of y'all do that too, okay? Some things we come to and we just have to study. But if we can understand the framework, I believe the Bible will make a lot more sense um, whenever we read it. So, Jesus um, here is pictured as coming out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, Matthew chapter 2, in verse uh, 14 there, it says 15, Out of Egypt I called my son. And this is quoted from Hosea chapter 11. And originally I read this passage of Scripture and I went back to Hosea in 11 and it says that it's talking about Israel. Remember in the Exodus, God called them out of Egypt. Uh, and then God calls Israel his son. It was a picture of Pharaoh holding God's firstborn son hostage. You remember Moses would go to Pharaoh and he would say, y'all remember singing the song? Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh baby, let my people go. Yeah, y'all remember we sang that in vacation Bible school. He would say, Pharaoh, let the people go. Would Pharaoh let them go? No, plague. Pharaoh, let them go. Would he let them go? No, plague. Until eventually the death plague happens. So now Jesus is pictured as the true Israel, as the true son. But when Matthew applies this text to Jesus, um, it helps us to see why we titled this sermon the second exodus. Moses was in Egypt. Moses, you might remember, they uh, fled. And Moses had to flee because he killed the Egyptians and it was made known. Moses flees to a place called Midian. Then later, um, Moses comes back to Egypt and he leads Israel out and out of bondage. Well, Jesus was in Israel. Now think about this with me. Jesus was in Israel, and it's ironic because Jesus flees where? To Egypt. And then after Jesus is in Egypt, at the end of our passage today, he comes back into Israel. It's ironic that Jesus fled to Egypt. Um, but when the passage says that out of Egypt I called my son, this happens at the moment whenever Jesus went from Israel into Egypt. What the New Testament is picturing for us is that Israel, the covenant people of God, this place where worship is supposed to happen, this place in Israel, in Jerusalem where the temple is, has become the enemy of God. Israel has become the new Egypt. And if you don't get that, then you're going to struggle in the New Testament because that's a huge, huge picture. Revelation 11:8, speaking of the two witnesses, says, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. What city was Jesus crucified in? Jerusalem. John says that Jerusalem has become the new Egypt. See, what Jesus is going to do, he is going to lead in the new covenant worship. He is going to lead the people away from old covenant Israel into a new covenant, into spiritual worship through the true Israel, who is Jesus Christ. So, And that's going to pertain of Jew and Gentile. And, and if we think about it, Egypt was a place of slavery, a place of bondage, a place of death. And the Old Covenant was the covenant of slavery and the covenant of bondage and the covenant of death. The exodus in the wilderness lasted for 40 years. And the Christians in the New Testament will endure a time of testing for 40 years. From 30 to the year 70 when the Old Covenant is vanished away. At the end of the exodus, Israel entered into Canaan. Okay, at the end of the Exodus, Israel entered into the land of Canaan. And at the end of the Exodus in the New Testament, the church will enter into the fullness of eternal life. Aren't you glad today that when you die that you go straight to heaven? Is that not good news? I mean, what, a, what a joy. I mean, you ever think about that? I mean, we start thinking about death. What's going to happen to the Christian when he dies? I mean, we're going to be with the Lord in heaven. I mean, what, what more comfort could we ask for? Now, I will uh, explain a little bit more of that in the fullness of eternal life another day. If you were in my Sunday school class, we just talked about that for a little bit. Um, but I want you to see how the authors of the New Testament, not just Matthew, but the Apostle Paul, he presents the New Testament as the second exodus as well. Turn over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to see some of these connections because this is extremely important for us to understand. Um, and it will help us to play on what's going on. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 It'll be on the screen, but I don't... I, how big is that on your screen? It's not very big on your screen. You should see it on my screen. It's, uh, 
it looks like a bunch of blobs. So <laughs> anyway, if you'll flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, then we'll take a look at this passage of Scripture. Where Mo, uh, Paul is instructing the church in the first century, and he's telling them how to live. Now listen to me. These practical applications for how they are to live, they apply to me and you and to, my, and to mine and your life. But they're specific here when he writes this letter to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to start in verse 1. It says this. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the Red Sea. Well, what events is he talking about? He's talking about the first exodus. Remember, they were led by the cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. They went through the Red Sea. All were baptized into Moses, meaning they came into Moses. Now, in the first century, he's telling them they've been spiritually born again and baptized into Christ. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. Well, what spiritual food did they eat? Remember when they cried for food? God rained down what? Manna. Jesus says in John chapter 6, I am the bread come down from heaven. Jesus is the new manna. Now it gets better. All ate the same, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. Remember when he struck the rock and the water came out? Jesus says that he's the living water, and here Paul says that rock was Christ. Verse 5. But with most of them, God was not well what? Pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Remember him griping to Moses. Moses, why did you bring us out of Egypt? We're going to come out here. We're going to die. We could have stayed back there, and everything would have been just fine. And most of them died off. Well, in the New Testament, did the majority of the Jews believe in Jesus, or did the majority reject Jesus? They rejected Jesus, just like their fathers did in the wilderness. But God saved a remnant of his people, Jew and Gentile, and made what we know as the church. Verse 6. Paul says, Now these things, the Exodus, became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell or died. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Remember they were getting bit by those serpents and that serpent got raised up on a pole and they had to look to the serpent in order to be healed and in order to be saved. The serpent represents curse and sin. On Jesus was laid the curse and the sin and Christ was raised up on a wooden pole and everybody who looks to him might be saved. You see the connections? Is that not good? Y'all just wait till we get to that on Wednesday nights. I'm, I'm coming for you. Just, I'm just letting you know. Verse 10. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now watch this. Now all these things happened to them in the first exodus as examples. And they were written for our, the first century church, admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The end of the age is not the end of the planet. The end of the age is the end of the Old Covenant age. So, whenever you read the New Testament, you're going to constantly hear language like, don't go back, persevere, don't turn around and go, just like they wanted to do in the Exodus. And all of that brings to mind the thoughts. Now, let me give you one more passage of Scripture. Turn to Hebrews 3. I want you to see not only Matthew teaching the second Exodus, not only the Apostle Paul teaching the second Exodus, but whoever wrote the book of Hebrews is also teaching the second exodus. It's pretty disputed on who wrote Hebrews. Some people think it was Paul. Um, I've heard some different answers. I don't know. But what I do know is he believed in the second exodus because the church was going through it. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 5 says this. And Moses indeed was faithful in all of his house as a servant. Let me ask a question, church. Who did God use to institute the, old, the first covenant, the old covenant? What leader? Moses. Jesus is being presented by Matthew as the new Moses. Moses was indeed faithful in all of his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, the new Moses, whose house we are. Now, why would the author of Hebrews say whose house we are? What house is he talking about? The church, the spiritual temple that was being built. Whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end of the age. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, 
If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of the trial in the wilderness. He's telling them, we're going through the same thing they were. Those things were written for our admonition, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. You're going through it, first century church. Now persevere and hold on. Verse 9, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. Now, how long's a generation? How long's the period of a generation? 40 years in the Bible. And said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Meaning, they're not going to enter Canaan. Verse 12, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. They were tempted. They heard of God. They knew of God. They wanted to go back. How many times do we see that in our own culture? I know the author of Hebrews is talking to the first century church, but it applies to me and you. How many times do we see people in our culture? Man, every week, it breaks my heart. People on our church roll, not on our church roll. They know Christ. They know the good things that Christ has done. They've come. They've partaken with the church. They've been in the church for years. And then what do they do? They look back to Egypt, back to their old way of life, and they turn around and go back. Friends, can I tell you, there's no greater life for you than the life that you know in Jesus Christ. You're not made to run around without the local church. You're not made to run around without reading and hearing the preaching of the Word of God. You're made to live a life that is around the people of God. And don't go back. You know what? I'm a preacher. You know what I have to have? I have to have you. I have to have people who are in my corner, who believe like I do, who urge me on. I don't know if y'all know this or not. But I'm a sinner. And I know this about y'all. You are too. Still. Even after you're saved. And we need each other. We need the body of Christ. To, to hear things like this. Don't go back. Verse 12. Brethren, beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. How can we exhort the church if we're not around the church? While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? See, Jesus is the new Moses leading the church into the new covenant. Now, with whom was He angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. This 40-year window of what we know as the New Testament uh, was also known, I believe, as the last days of Israel. Moses told about the last days of Israel right before his death in Deuteronomy. Now you just have to listen to me as I read this. Listen to Deuteronomy 32.5. And remember that a generation is 40 years. Deuteronomy 32.5, Moses says, predicting the end of Israel at the end of the New Testament age. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Moses, uh, he tells them, these people in our future, at the end of Israel's days, a wicked generation, a wicked 40 years of people. A people who knew Jesus, who looked at Jesus when they walked among them, and what did they do to Jesus? They killed him. Now listen, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32, 5 in Philippians in chapter 2, verse 15. It says this, That you may become blameless and harmless, the children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, as whom you shine among lights in the world. See, let me just explain to you what happened. God made a covenant with Israel. Israel was pictured as God's child. They went astray and they forsook the covenant. God himself, Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, comes and he dies. And you know what they did to him? They killed him. But there were some Jews and Gentiles in the first century who were saved who followed the new Moses in the new covenant in the second Exodus. And those are the people that our faith is built upon. Those who looked to Jesus and believed in him. Let me see if I can explain it another way. I think, Keith, there's a chart. Hopefully this chart will help you kind of visualize what I'm talking about. From A.D. 30 to A.D. 70, the Old Covenant was growing old and ready to vanish away at the end of the age once the temple was destroyed. 
See how in AD 30, when Jesus instituted the new covenant, you had the old covenant on the scene, and it's growing closer and closer to its vanishing away by AD 70 when the temple's destroyed. Write down Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. It says exactly what I just said. But from AD 30 to AD 70, the new covenant was growing. See how it starts small? But it grows and it's maturing, preparing for the time when it would inherit by itself. See, you live in a day-to-day where there's no old covenant. We don't have Brother Swan going over to Jerusalem to kill goats and animals over the top of his shoulder three times a year. We don't have that. Why? Because we don't need any more sacrifices. We've got Jesus Christ. It's all been fulfilled and bound up in him. He's the true and the better Israel. Amen. Aren't you thankful? Man, that's good. You know, they never had eternal life back then. You don't see the word eternal life until you get to the New Testament. Why do you not see eternal life until you get to the New Testament? Because finally, somebody came who could pay for your sin. Somebody finally came who was perfect. And when you trusted in him, not only did Christ die for your sins, but you received the perfection of Jesus Christ. You stand before the Father. You say, well, how good Zach Davis? Well, I ain't much. But I'm looking to the man who hung on the middle cross. And that's my hope. And that's why I can say, Lord, here I am. Praise God. What good news. You know, and if you think about it, the Jews, all they knew for the old... I'm not going to finish this sermon today. I can already tell. I'm sorry. It's going to be a part two next week. Sorry. Um, The Jews in the first century, they thought they were God's covenant people. They said, well, we're we're born from Abraham. We're God's people. Now they killed Jesus, the Messiah, and you've got these new people saying... Well, we believe in Jesus the Messiah. We're the people of God. So what we have to find out in the New Testament is, who are the true people of God? Are the people of God those who are physically born in Israel, or are the true people of God those who look to faith in Jesus Christ and fulfill the promises of Abraham? And friends, it's those who look to Jesus Christ by faith. And if you're here today, guess what you are? The true children of Abraham because you believe the Messiah. And those promises of eternal life, they're not just for them. They're for me and you too. And that's the good news of the gospel. And it all starts with Jesus, who's the new Moses. So when you go back and you read the New Testament, such as the book of Acts, what you're going to see are those Jewish religious leaders constantly persecuting and killing the people in the church. Well, of course they are. They think they're liars. They think they're wrong. But the church endures and perseveres until the old covenant vanishes away. All right, let me see if I can make a little more progress here. Um, The next prophecy in Matthew, let's go back to Matthew chapter 2. The next prophecy brings us to Rachel weeping for her children. And I want you to see some connections of Jesus and the life of Moses here. In Exodus 1, 15 and 16, it says this about the time of Moses. It says, Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall do what? Kill him. If it's a daughter, she shall live. Now, this parallel is identical to what Matthew says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. It says this about Jesus and Herod. Jesus, the new Moses. Herod is the new Pharaoh. Then Herod when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all of the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts. But just like Moses escaped when his mom put him in the basket down the river, so Jesus escapes by fleeing the new Egypt, Israel, and going down to Egypt. You see the picture? It's the exact same story. Now, here's where we need more of the Old Testament background. It says that Rachel was weeping uh, for her children. And obviously she was mourning because of the slaughter of babies. Rachel is a picture of the mothers of Israel. Y'all know when somebody says something bad about your kid, like you just instant trigger. I didn't understand that, and I don't think anybody understands that until you have a baby. But whenever you have a kid and somebody's like, your kid's got boogers in his nose or something like that, you know, it just makes you mad. I mean, somebody said, can you imagine if the governor of Arkansas was running around and had a decree to try to kill your baby? Can you imagine what you'd be doing? I mean, just think about that. You talk about pressure and anger. That's the situation these ladies were in. And they're weeping. But see, this picture of weeping brings to mind all of the times in the Old Testament when Israel was in sin. God would send another nation to persecute them, but he would always exile people out. 
the place of their exile was a town called Ramah, which was six miles north of Jerusalem. They'd go to Ramah, which is, by the way, is in your prophecy here in verse 18, and they would flee out. What God was doing was he would always save a remnant of his people. When they were in sin, those who believed, he would save them. Jesus is doing the same thing in the first century. The majority of Jews want to kill the Christ, but those who look to him, Jesus saves. He saves them completely. Um, Y'all got anybody in your life who's a negative person? If they're sitting by you on the pew, don't look at them. But if you've got anybody in your life that's a negative person, then you know what it's like to be around them. Um, when I was in high school, I, we were playing uh, a homecoming game, and I had a pretty good game. I mean, I just, you know, toot my own horn here just for a second. I mean, I, it was a game like L.D. Tarleton used to have. If y'all didn't know L.D. Tarleton was a really good football player, go ask him about his playing days or ask Bubba. He'll tell you. Hey, L.D. Tarleton was a good football player. But I had one of them L.D. Tarleton type games. I threw for, you know, 400 yards and six touchdowns in the first half, you know. And uh, we were playing Manila, who's terrible, so that's not really a bragging story. That's... That's not a football powerhouse. If we were playing Osceola, it would have been better. So, and, you know, but we were playing Manila. They were terrible. But I had a receiver that I missed, and I missed him wide open for a touchdown. And he was mad at me. So we're in high school, and we get to the dance, and he won't even look at me, you know. And I've just had the, the best game that anybody's ever had, and this guy won't even speak to me. Don't you love people like that? Well, that's what Matthew just did. Jeremiah 31 is the greatest New Covenant passage in the Old Testament. Matthew quotes the only bad passage in the whole stinking thing when he talks about these babies being killed. And he brings that into mind. But what he's doing, he's bringing this picture of this new exile. See, Romans chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 are going to talk about Jesus leading those who were saved in Israel out away from this old covenant structure. And in that, he was going to bring the Gentiles in. So the Jew and Gentile would mix together in the body of Christ. And it would be a glorious glorious thing so when it says in verse 18 a voice was heard in Ramah lamentation weeping and great mourning think of those mothers mourning Rachel weeping for her children but don't just let the mourning be something bad because the exile was good remember when Daniel was exiled and Shadrach Meshach and Abednego were exiled because of the sin of the people eventually they came back into the land you know what happens in the New Testament those who were saved in Christ inherit eternal life you are a part of that I think I will finish this. I've got a couple minutes left. The third point today is that he shall be called a Nazarene from verses 19 all the way down to the end of the chapter. So Herod dies, so Joseph and the family head back to the land of Israel. And this passage is reminiscent of Moses at the burning bush. Remember, God came to Moses at the burning bush. Moses, go back to Egypt. You're going to lead the people out. And that's exactly what he does. God tells Joseph to take the family back to Israel, which is the new Egypt. And once Moses got back to Egypt, he started the work right away. Now watch what Matthew does. Matthew chapter 3 is going to skip forward some 28 to 30 years. He's going to skip to the part when Jesus comes back right to when the work starts. Right to when he starts to present himself as the Messiah and as the Savior for the last three, three and a half years of his life. And that's God providentially bringing to fulfillment um, more prophecy. But one thing that's unique about this passage, it says that he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, the first two prophecies, we can look back to Hosea 11 and say, yeah, out of Egypt I called my son. It says that. We can look back to Jeremiah 31 where it says that Rachel was weeping for her children. We can see that. But he shall be called a Nazarene is not quoted directly out of any particular scripture. But it is a concept that's taught. And we should know this better than anybody because we just went through the story of Samson, who is a Nazarite. And this comes from a similar uh, Hebrew word. So the word Nazarite means, um, or Nazir, means to be set apart or to be made holy. And this town of Nazareth brings to mind Jesus as the new, true, and better Samson, the holy warrior of God. Samson freed Israel from the Philistines. Jesus will free people from the ultimate sin and the ultimate death. You know, one thing that I have to do every week, I have to take a, a passage of Scripture like this, which, I mean, it, it's not the easiest passage of Scripture in the world that we looked at. We just looked at three prophecies, figuring out how Matthew's presenting Jesus as Moses. I mean, that's, that's not basic Bible skills 101. But the task of the preacher every week is to say, how do we apply this to our life? 
how does this passage, what, what can I take from this? How do I apply it to my life? Practically speaking, I don't think I need to tell you to flee if a man named Herod tries to kill your baby. Okay? That's, you probably can figure that one out. I don't think I need to explain to you the route from here to Egypt. I don't think biblically you're supposed to take your family from here to Egypt. I think that was specific to Christ. Or how to interpret a dream like Joseph because God gave us a book and he doesn't give us dreams like that anymore. But one reminder that does need to be given to the Christian church. Because we read this passage and we say, well, who cares? Well, you should care because of what Peter said. 1 Peter 3.15 But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you. And that hope is Christ Jesus. With meekness, and do it gently, in learning, and in fear, reverence to God. See, your task amongst a world that doesn't know God, and by the way, you do live in a world that doesn't know God. If they said America used to be a Christian nation, we're headed the other way now, okay? But either way, it can be turned around because of revival. But do you know who God's going to use to do it? You, the people who shine as a light in the world. God said that you're a city set on a hill. Friends, if you don't know the story of Jesus Christ... How can we convince the world that he's the true Messiah? You know there are other religions who say that there is a different Messiah, that Jesus is not the Messiah? Well, I would just simply ask, is the Bible our final authoritative inspired authority? And if it is, then who else in the first century fled from Israel to Egypt so that it could be fulfilled saying, out of Egypt I called my son? Who else in the first century was born at a time when Herod was trying to kill the babies, but he was the Messiah. Who else took the journey from Nazareth to Egypt, to Galilee, back into Nazareth? Who took the journey? Who followed the road map? There's only one. And there's only one person who could be the Messiah. Whatever the world says, we've got people today who are still looking for a Messiah. Friends, they missed him. And it's your job to go tell them who it is. And the better you know the story, the better you understand the prophecies, the more that we sit down and we read the hard passage, such as Matthew 2, 13 to 23, the better you know it, the greater impact you can have on your kids and on your family and on your world. But can I just speak personally for a second? Understanding the Bible gives me the greatest sense of pleasure in my life. Not just because of knowledge. Yeah, we want to know things. You know, I don't get a thrill out of somebody looking at me and saying, well, Zach's really smart. You know why? Because there's somebody who's smarter than me. But what does bring joy to my heart and encouragement to my walk with Christ is that I know that everything he said, he fulfilled and he did. And just like you, there are things in my life that I'm looking at in the future and, and, I'm, and I want to know, God, are you going to be faithful to me again? Lord, I know you've been faithful before. Are you going to be faithful again? And when I can take a book like this and I can look back at everything that God's done and I can look back at every prophecy that he fulfilled, and I can say, he has never let anyone down yet. Then in my life, I can know that tomorrow, that whatever I face, God will be faithful because he is faithful to his children. And I would just ask you today, church, what is it in your life that maybe needs to be given to God? What is it in your life today that you're asking, can I trust God with this? Why would you not trust him? Why could you not trust him? What has he ever done? Now, does this mean you don't go through hard times? Every one of us go through hard times. But you know what I believe because I'm a Christian? I believe that God sometimes puts us in those hard times. And in those hard times, we find out something about ourselves. Am I going to look to myself for these answers? Am I going to trust in myself? I'm an American. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. You know what? Sometimes, friends, you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Sometimes you need the God of heaven to reach down and lift you up. And every day, strengthen you. And strengthen you. And strengthen you. And when you deal with death, or when you deal with a kid who's gone wild, or you deal with cancer that comes to the family, where do you look? Where do you look when you struggle in your Christian life? Look to the God who fulfilled all the promises. The Micah 5-2 baby born in Bethlehem. The Hosea 11-2 one who went out of Egypt. The Jeremiah 31, 23 baby who was born in the midst of Rachel weeping for her kids. Look to the one who was the true Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth. Look to him and you'll find your yes and amen.
you'll find every satisfaction that you need in Christ Jesus. Don't you dare look to drugs. Don't you dare look to pills. Don't you dare look to some other form of anything other than the word of God. Because Jesus said that man can't live by bread alone. But he needs every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Friends, go feast on that. Go feast on the better Moses. Go feast on the one who will lead you away from the life of sin and death. Go feast on the one in John 6 who said he's the bread come down out of heaven. Go feast on the one who said he's the true rock in John 7. That he's the living water that you can drink of. Go feast on the one who said he'll give you eternal life. He's good on every promise he's ever made. And he'll be good on another one for you. Today, if you don't know Christ Jesus and you're in sin and death, then you turn from your sin. And you trust in this Jesus Christ. He is the Savior and the only Messiah. I don't care what Islam says. I don't care what the Muslims say. I don't care what Buddha says or the Hindus say. Give me the word of God. And I'm going to bank my whole eternity on that. And I'm asking that you would do the same thing.